Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom, validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology, to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering, and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different, each guest is unique, each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. I think that astrology as a topic and a body of knowledge and practice doesn't need an introduction, really. Whether you are a professional astrologer, dabbling in or learning astrology, an avid reader of the monthly and annual horoscopes online, or simply don't believe that your astrological chart has anything to do with your life, I am pretty sure that you will find this episode worth listening to, to say the least. Especially that the expert I have invited to my show is a legend in a class of his own. My very special guest today is Stephen Forrest. Stephen is a world-renowned and well-respected thought leader and expert in astrology. He's been practicing for many decades. He's the author of several astrological bestsellers including The Inner Sky and The Book of Pluto. Stephen's work has been translated into many languages. He has traveled around the world teaching his brand of choice-centered evolutionary astrology, which integrates free will, grounded humanistic psychology, and ancient metaphysics. Stephen served on the Ethics Committee of the International Society for Astrological Research from 2002 to 2006, helping to write the Code of Ethics that governs professional astrology. He won the 2018 Regulus Award for Education and in 2020 opened his online school, the Forest Center for Evolutionary Astrology. Rob Bresny, in his popular Real Astrology column, simply calls him the most brilliant astrologer alive. And now, Stephen joins me from Borrego Springs in California. Hello, Stephen. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure and honor to have you on my show. Well, thank you, Anna. I'm really happy to be here. It's good to be back in Australia, even if only electronically. (laughs) Oh, that's wonderful, wonderful to meet you. When looking for an astrology expert to appear on my show, out of the many great astrologers out there, I was intuitively drawn and actually guided to you. And that's for a good reason. Your approach to astrology is a pinnacle of the intersection of science and spirituality, which is the undercurrent of this podcast. To set the scene for this conversation, Could you please share with us briefly how you became interested in astrology, and specifically in evolutionary astrology, which we'll be talking about? Yes, uh, an excellent question. Brings me right back to the book of Genesis in my life, which is a long, long time ago now. (laughs) Uh, Interesting that uh, your approach is the the synthesis of of science and a more humanistic model of of the psyche. I I entered astrology through exactly the same door. My my family was rather conventional, and uh, I didn't hear anything negative about astrology, but I didn't hear anything about it at all. What I I was interested in was looking through telescopes. I, I became an amateur astronomer when I was very, very young. In fact, one of my earliest memories uh, as a little boy was wanting Santa Claus to bring me a telescope 
so I could look at the heavens. And uh, Santa Claus <laughs> didn't get the message. I I got a little spy. So <laughs> <laughs> I could spy on my friends. I guess. <laughs> but uh, I I did spend most of my teenage years looking through telescopes and and the, the sense of not not just the science of astronomy, but the the sense of wonder and magic that I, I experienced looking through telescopes led me to astrology. I just had the intuitive feeling, even as a as a kid, that the, the heavens weren't just amazing, although that was enough, but it was more than that, that they they meant something, that there was a message there for us. I didn't know what it was, but I was determined to try to figure out what it might be. Wonderful. And it's interesting that while looking at the sky through a telescope, you were not drawn to astronomy, but rather to astrology, because a lot of people started uh, their career in astronomy in the similar manner. But you're sort of digressed, if you like, <laughs> onto another, and there are, say, more interesting or more, more exciting path. Beautiful. What is evolutionary astrology and how is it different from other astrology approaches? And how many are there? With so many different schools of astrology and different approaches by various astrologers, is this fluidity of astrological analysis and readings assisting or hindering the acceptance of astrology as credible by people? If I went, for example, to 10 different professional astrologers in the span of a few days, would I receive potentially 10 different readings? Mm -hmm, yes, a complicated question. If you went to 10 competent astrologers working in a diversity of traditions, you would hear a lot of different language, but the bottom line, the sort of point of what they were telling you would be strangely similar. It's it's one of the most baffling things about astrology, really, that many different systems of astrology, which contradict each other, uh, all all seem to work. They they sort of settle on similar bottom lines, so, although they will take different pathways getting there. One of my favorite short comment about this comes from a wonderful older American astrologer named Robert Hand, who was once uh, challenged about which system we should use or he was using. And he had the, the most terrific answer. He, he said, which is truer, French or German? <laughs> Absolutely beautiful response because there, there's the astrology of India, Vedic astrology, for example, called Jyotish over there, which uses a, a different zodiac than off by 20 some degrees compared to the one that, that I use. And yeah. yet, uh, the last time I had an astrological reading myself, I, I chose a, a Vedic astrologer to do it for me, uh, mostly because I, I wouldn't trip over my own ego. If somebody were <laughs> if somebody were speaking in my system, I, I would, of course, feel the need to correct them. <laughs> but, but the Vedic astrologer, I could be gracefully quiet and just take in the message, and it was helpful. <laughs> Oh, I love that. And also that comparison to different languages, I think is brilliant. Because, yes, we have uh, the meaning is pretty much the same when you hear the same thing said in various languages. However, there is also an overlay of culture. There is an overlay of other aspects uh, specific to the country of origin. So I think this is a very good analogy. I love it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, one of your one element earlier in your your question was uh, basically a definition of evolutionary astrology and yes. and how it's distinct from the other branches. Uh, it's a big subject, but uh, here's there's a question all astrologers, all branches of astrology will attempt to answer the, the sort of obvious question, what does my chart mean? You know, anybody who claims to be an astrologer is going to take a shot at that. Uh, we evolutionary astrologers do that too, of course. But we add another question that tends to be absent from, the, from all the alternative systems, and that is, why do you have the chart that you have? 
Just that, that simple question. But why is it there? Once we once we recognize that astrology works, and anybody who gives it a chance, anybody who just looks at it with an open mind for a few hours is going to say, oh my God, this system, there's something going on here as crazy as it seems. It really does work. Once that is established, there are two ways to explain it. One, that life is completely random. I don't believe this, but life is completely random and pointless. And through some weird physical law, the instant of your birth imprints you with a personality and eventually you die and it didn't mean anything. I, again, I have little patience for that perspective, but there's a certain logic to it if somebody wants to start from that assumption. The alternative, the only possible alternative is that you have your chart for a reason, that there's a cause. Now, uh, next line will probably make you laugh, but it's an important link in the chain. You've had your birth chart ever since the minute you were born. The, the two ideas are inseparable, of course. And, and therefore, anything that caused you to have this chart, anything that made it meaningful for you to be the person you are today, had to have happened before you were born. The cause has to precede the effect, and your birth chart is an effect. Now, that is emphatically not a proof of reincarnation, but it's quite consistent with the idea of reincarnation. And in practical terms, evolutionary astrology, we look at the symbolism of the present chart, and from it we derive some insights into uh, what might have hurt you or what might have gone wrong in a prior life, what you're healing, correcting, what your next evolutionary step is. So this is where the ancient metaphysics you know, come in, reincarnational language. But I'd like to take this one step further. There, there's a, a line I, I love to use with my clients, at least if they seem to present with a sense of humor. I wouldn't try this on anybody who didn't. But I, I, I ask them to reflect upon how dumb they were 10 years ago. You know, and and at first, it, it sounds like, a, like I'm insulting them. I always say it with a smile. But th then <laughs> I point out that what that means is that they're wiser today than they were 10 years ago. And so it's actually good news, you know, not, not, not an insult. And, and so we are all evolving. We can observe this. It's, it's a, a basis of many philosophies, but it's not a philosophical statement. It's an objective, ob observational kind of statement. You're not the same person you were 10 years ago. You have wisdom you didn't have 10 years ago, and you probably have some scars where the wisdom went in. So evolution is not just happening lifetime to lifetime. It's happening minute to minute. And where evolutionary astrology comes in in practical terms is actually helping people know in a sense, where to put their foot next in life for optimal evolutionary bang for the buck, so to speak. We want to help them grow. That's what it's all about. Okay, so the actual birth chart that is based on the birth data doesn't change, but it can be interpreted and work with for the purpose you have just described, correct? Yes, absolutely correct. I would, your, your birth chart is, uh, is, is fixed until you leave the body, but it is not fixed in meaning in any rigid way. The, I, I always think of the, the basic matrix of astrological symbols. It's best to understand them as a set of questions rather than a set of personality traits. And it is your fate. I don't like that word very much, but, but it's your fate to face certain questions and certain possibilities in this lifetime. And the universe has given you tools for the job, how to get it right, but it failed to give you the instruction manual. And that's where the birth chart comes into play. And, and so when we are young, uh, typically, we'll, we'll make a weaker, less conscious, less individuated response to our chart than we do as time goes by. And we learn the lessons of life, uh, 
the hard lessons and and the easy ones and gradually become more aware. Mm, interesting. What is your view on on the school of thought which says that our birth chart or our life to be more precise starts not at birth but at the point of conception? Mm-hmm. Well, c- certainly we could make an argument that physically, the, the the physical entity has its origins at the at the point of conception. Um, this gets into interesting territory. The, my my first comment would be uh, uh, it'll probably make us all smile a little bit, but it's important. Um, the the time of birth. Is is such that you know it's a big event and people tend to note it. They look at the clock that the the obstetrician writes it down, you know, and so on. Uh, here's where the smile comes in. At the moment of conception, people are usually not looking at their watches. If you get my, <laughs> our, our our mind is elsewhere. One would hope uh, at that moment. So uh, I'm open to the possibility that a conception chart would actually be informative and teach us something, but they're really hard to find. So I don't know of anybody who's actually going to be able to test the <laughs> hypothesis. Fun to say, but I think it's kind of the heart of the matter. Uh, uh, let me take it a, a step deeper, a little bit more over to the science side of things. Mm-hmm. So uh, a baby, uh, advanced but still embryonic baby in the womb, uh, in the in the sac, floating in the amniotic fluid of, of the mother's body. Well, the amniotic fluid, the salt water, is, is basically a pretty good conductor of electromagnetic energy. But while, while the baby is in the womb, uh, the baby's body is, in a sense, inseparable from the mother's body, and there's one kind of macro uh, field there. And then suddenly, at the moment of birth, the breaking of water, the, the head emerges from the birth canal, and, and we begin to experience a, a very powerful flux in the, in, in the intensity of the baby's response to the electromagnetic field. It's, it's different because the amniotic fluid is no longer conducting that. And so it's kind of a signature moment, a crisis moment. And the baby becomes an independent object in the universe, so to speak, and is charged then for the first time with the electromagnetic field, uh, the ambient one, the electromagnetic field of the Earth. Now, Earth's electromagnetic field, by the way, is floating in the solar system, of course. And if you move a magnet with a magnetic field through another magnetic field, of course, they interact. And so the positions of the planets, most of the planets, this gets a little technical, most but not all of them have electromagnetic fields. All of them have some generated by the solar wind passing over the planet. And and so you have all these magnets, commonly known as planets, moving through the larger solar electronic field, and that's transmitted to the Earth's electronic field. And at the instant of birth, the baby has its first independent exposure to that electromagnetic field. So the solar system transmitted through Earth and down into the baby at the moment of birth. And the facts that I've just said are are truly facts, and, and no scientist would argue with them. The conclusion I draw is in the category of a hypothesis. You know, this may be how astrology works. It may be the physical reason it works. I I, I can refute that, but I don't want to be too long-winded. There's an interesting refutation. If you're interested, I'll give it to you. Please do. Please. <laughs> okay. Here's the I, refutation is maybe too strong a word. All that I just said may very well be the, the facts of why astrology does work as observed. But but here's the here's the enormous complication. There are people who've uh, astrologers who've made a lot of money doing stock market predictions. You know how a company's uh, stock is going to perform. Here in the United States, uh, generally what they're looking at is the what they call the IPO chart, the initial public offering chart. It's usually 9:30 a.m. on a Monday morning in New York City, the first time a stock is traded publicly. Those charts work like crazy. Those astrologers make a lot of money. They can forecast how companies will perform within you know reasonable limits. Okay, as soon as we see that, we've got a problem. A publicly traded company 
is not a physical body. It's not like a baby. It, it's nothing but an idea, nothing but a social agreement among humans. And so there's no nothing physical to receive the impulse of the Earth's magnetic field. And so, uh, again, the earlier explanation may be accurate, but it does not explain the efficacy of, uh, of stock market astrology, for, for one example. Mm, interesting. Yes. So this raises an important question. How does astrology, in terms of forecasting, work for non-sentient beings like an entity, a company, an organization, uh, a country, and many other examples. In fact, Stephen, you must be reading my mind because you have answered my, <laughs> my, my next question to an extent at least. This is, I think, at the core of people's acceptance or non-acceptance of the effectiveness and credibility of astrology. So I'd like to ask this question from a slightly different angle. What would you say to someone who doesn't believe in astrology? Number one, how does it work, which I guess you have explained. So the question there is, okay, when we get imprinted at the time of birth with, uh, with this particular electromagnetic field, and I get it, that has all the energies of all the planets and their uh, interactions, how do we know which planetary magnetic field and imprint creates a particular uh, effect or has a particular characteristic? So apart from the scientific explanation of the imprint of the electromagnetic field, which can be refuted, how would you explain or what is your view on how does this work? And then if you could move on to outlining perhaps some practical and any other benefits of astrology mm -hmm. the uh the piece about how we know that mars means this and venus means that and and so on it was one one element of your your comments there um i believe the honest answer to that is simply uh centuries many centuries of of observation just simply that uh, it's it's uh, empirically derived uh, from experience. We we would uh, we know, for example, uh, that if a, if a person is born with a certain planet rising, for example, uh, technically we'd say on the ascendant, just means dawning, like the sun would dawn in the morning. That that they will present themselves socially in a sense. They will dawn on people like that planet. So if I'm born at the rising of Venus, I am I'm a Venus kind of person, and anybody who looks at me can see that. And that that's uh that's an observed reality in astrology. And and it brings me right back to the empirical origins of it, that as our ancestors in prehistory, nobody really knows when all this started, uh, they would see, okay, the 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 son of the king, for example, it was born at the rising of Mars, and nobody knew what that meant, but it's important because it's the son of the king. So they register it and he becomes the most warlike king in the history of the king kingdom and and so oh well maybe that's what mars means and and if we see it once who knows if we see it working 10 times you know with the the son of the of the baker and the high priest and all all this we we start to sense the pattern so it uh, astrology is sort of a funny line i'm going to use here but i think it's based on what we we could call folk statistics it's it's not like science statistics where we're actually doing numbers. A lot of astrologers do that now, but but in the thousands of years that it existed, uh, it's just folk statistics, you know, people gathering their impressions. And and uh, I just add one more piece to that, one more link to the chain. If you're sitting with a human being and you're doing astrological counsel for that person, and if you say something completely wrong and they tell you it's completely wrong, or or they're just glassy-eyed and obviously bored out of their skull. That's negative reinforcement. And meanwhile, the happier version of the story, you say something and the person's eyes are wide and they're thankful and they're helped and they can relate to it. That's positive reinforcement, clearly. Now let that run for a few thousand years and, and you, you start to get an astrological tradition that's based on what works for people. 
you know, and, and we we learn and we pass it on and the snowball is rolled down the mountain. It's a pretty big snowball now. Mm, yes. Now, some people say that the original astrology knowledge was actually given to people thousands of years ago by some evolved, highly evolved civilizations from other planets who possess this knowledge and or some beings from another dimension who possess this knowledge spiritually. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wide open uh, to, to those possibilities. Uh, I'm a, a particularly wide open, in fact, actually rather confident to say that you know, it had to do with beings from other dimensions. You know, living in the world I live in, I'm aware that many people would think I sounded flaky, but I'm rather confident you don't think that when I, oh. I speak of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, there are other dimensions, and, and uh, many of us, humans have known that, you know, since the beginning of human time. It's only in the recent century or century and a half that we've gotten stupid enough to question it, you know, and to ignore our intuitive sense of the presence of of guides and beings who are higher than us and who care about us. And uh, I think not only astrology, but almost anything that's in the category of inspiration, uh, you know, the, the Renaissance, the classical music, uh, the great poetry of all civilizations, uh, that, that it was whispered in our ears by angels. You know, that's, that's one way of saying yeah. it. I'm comfortable with that. Modern psychologists might say uh, it constellates in the unconscious and surfaces. <laughs> and okay, if you want to call it that, that's all right. It's, we're just a bunch of monkeys down here pointing at the moon anyway. <laughs> and by the way, we can go on the show out on the limb and into the rabbit holes as far as, far as we want to, because this <laughs> is my specialty. <laughs> yes, so yes, my audience are quite open-minded and spiritually oriented. So yes, I, I have no boundaries and I will get to, to that later on because I've got a particular hairy question for you. <laughs> sort of mind twisting question towards the end. Okay, so coming back to explaining to someone the purpose and practical and any other benefits of astrology. How would anyone want to have their chart drawn and an insight into their life through the astrological chart? Why would they do that? You know, I, in, a, in a more perfect world, and actually even in this world, uh, nobody really needs astrology. I mean, I've devoted my life to it. I, I believe in it. I, I, I think it's precious. But there are plenty of people who live conscious, comfortable, happy, meaningful lives without the benefit of astrology. And there's no shortage of crazy fools who are practicing astrology. You know, it, it, it doesn't turn us into saints. But I, I think of uh, a good analogy would be like uh, paying attention to the weather report. And if you in the morning, the, the weather man, weather woman, whatever, uh, tells you that uh, there's a 40% chance of rain today, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you decide to bring an umbrella. Maybe you don't. Maybe if you decided to bring the umbrella, you're glad that you did. But, you know, it's like you've been informed of the weather, so to speak, and, and you make your own decisions within it. And astrology is, is very, very much like that. Um, let me take it a step further. Uh, here, here are two uh, uh, familiar ideas, cliches almost, and we've all heard both of them. One, uh, you should believe in yourself. You've got to follow your dream, follow your heart, you know, be, be bold. And uh, okay, beautiful. But here's another one. Um, if anything can possibly go wrong, it certainly will. You know, Murphy's Law, famously. And that's obviously a much more cynical statement. But any honest person confronted with these two statements and thinking about the memories of their own life 
will realize that there were times when that first statement nailed it, that was exactly right, and times when Mr. Murphy, they should have paid attention, you know? And uh, in other words, you can find a cliche to support just about any philosophical position that you want. Now, where astrology comes in is it can tell you when to trust which of those attitudes, you know, how to align yourself with the cosmic weather. So there, there are times to be bold, for example, and there are times to be cautious. There are times to not question yourself, and there are times to question yourself because you might be wrong. And, and astrology can give us a, a, a kind of hyper-consciousness, uh, hyper-awareness of, of where we are in relationship to this cosmic weather. And if we get it right, uh, often enough and for long enough, what we find is that we're living a meaningful life. I have a, a sort of punchy way of saying this when I'm sitting with a client who who uh, doesn't seem to be on the verge of a nervous breakdown. There are some people I, I, I wouldn't use the strong image you would, but many I would. I, I was sitting down to do an initial birth chart reading, and I say, this is a blueprint for the life you were born to live, a life that if you live it, you will come to the last hours of your life, you'll be lying on your deathbed with a smile on your face because you know that you live the life that you were born to live. And there is no greater victory in this world for anyone than coming to the end of the trail with that kind of good heart. How do you get from here to there? Well, here's the map, here's the blueprint. That's the spirit of evolutionary astrology. Wow. I really love what you just said, all the bits everything because starting from the umbrella analogy which i think is brilliant and i love your answer and i and i do hope that it will help people who are sitting on the fence if you like that it will help them to understand the purpose of astrology so brilliant thank you thank you so much okay so is our birth chart synonymous with our what is it is often referred to as our soul blueprint Yes, yes, it is the soul's blueprint. It, it's, it maps out the of all the lives you could possibly live, the the one that will be the, of the most benefit to you spiritually, where where you will meet the right people, uh, be in the right relationship with uh, all life's basic questions, like uh, how important is is work for me versus my inner life, is creativity an important part of my journey this time or or not? Uh, oh, here's a big one. Uh, am I wired to be married or am I better off single? You know, it's, if we get that question wrong, we're in trouble either way. And and so th these are these are not moral questions like, should I kill people or should I steal? Everybody supposedly has the same answers to those questions. But astrology comes in at this sort of second level where it's not about the moral absolutes, so to speak, you know, the things we should or shouldn't do, all of us, but rather, you know, just for me personally, or you personally, uh, what's going to feed your soul? And astrology answers those questions. So very much a, a blueprint for the life you were born to live. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. We know that in psychic readings, it is easy to read the past and even the present, but predicting the future is a whole new ball game, and uh, the level of accuracy of the reading drops significantly. I assume that it's the same with astrology readings. Could you please speak to this and also add your thoughts on this part of my question? Do astrologers need psychic abilities in working with the charts. And there are many psychic readers who have learned astrology and use it as an additional tool in their readings. But my question is about astrologers. In your readings, in, in working with, with the client's chart, do you 
utilize your psychic skills to, I don't know, maybe to see the Akashic records of the person or, or in any other aspect. So about the accuracy of forecasting, if you like, or prediction, and whether there is any connection between psychic skills and astrology or a need for using psychic skills in astrology. Yes. Let me uh, let me start with the second question about the, the psychic side of things, and we'll, we'll look at prediction. Um, I used to be sort of touchy about this question. You know, uh, like people would come to me uh, for readings and and because of the stigma connected to astrology, it's it's improved lately, but it, it used to be worse. And 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 it's like they they would want to own the reading, they want to accept it, but they didn't want to believe in astrology, you know, which put them in a bind. And and so I, I would get this sort of conspiratorial wink from them. Uh, so you must be very psychic, aren't you? As if uh, accepting me as a psychic was easier than accepting astrology. And uh, I, I I found myself sort of uh, huffy about it and, and you know, resistance, like, no, I'm not psychic at all. But uh, in, in fact, sometimes I, I, but also most of my colleagues have discussed this with, we will have uh, experiences that can only be explained psychically. Like uh, one time, for example, in the course of a, a reading, I, I had to, in spinning a metaphor, I had to make up the, the last four digits of an identity code for the person. In America, we have some called social security numbers. And I was just making up randomly the four digits and the person's jaw dropped. My social security number is in the chart. I'd made up the right four numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly do not experience myself as a psychic. I, I have uh, intuitive experiences and get impressions sometimes like most people. I, I'm a believer, but I, I, you know, I mostly I try to navigate with my brains, you know, rather than, than the angels grabbing the steering wheel. Um, but I cannot deny that uh, psychic intuition plays a role in astrology. It can enhance, uh, enhance astrology uh, quite a lot. Um, I, I would also take it a step further. I, I think that something happens to our consciousness as we entrain our consciousness with the basic symbols of astrology, which is like the machine language of the universe. And as your psyche begins to constellate around Mercury and Venus and Mars, we, we seem to become a clearer channel for those psychic powers to flow through us. So yes, absolutely, there, there's a role for psychic sensitivity in astrology. But and I've been sort of eager to race to, to this, but um, I have uh, written over the years uh, computerized texts that, that interpret charts. I've worked with computer programmers. I'm currently working on a revamping of the whole project called Lila, anybody with an iPhone, L-I-L-A, Relate Deeper. It's, it's a free app at this point. Eventually, it'll be pay. And the, the point there is that that I can teach a computer to do pretty helpful, accurate astrological readings. And obviously, that has zero to do with psychic sensitivity. So uh, astrology is a science or a craft that can stand on its own two feet without reference to psychic powers. But if we happen to have psychic sensitivity as well, it enhances astrology and it becomes more accurate, provided we're spiritually clear enough with our psychic sensitivity that we don't let our desires and fears knock us off base. That's that's always the danger with psychics. You know, uh, some of them are brilliant, some of them are evolved souls, some of them are quite psychic and crazy as can be. You know, there, there's uh, there's a lot of variety among the psychics. Thank you. Very good point. Okay, so what about forecasting? When I sit with somebody, one of the first things I'm going to say is I'm not a fortune teller. Uh, I'll say, I have no idea what's going to happen to you. 
I often like to say it just in those words, it often startles a person because so often people come to sit with the astrologer with the mindset or the expectation that the astrologer has a crystal ball and will see the future. Often people are are, are scared. Oh, I hope it's not bad, you know, for example. And and there are astrologers who practice that way, who who predict the future. And they're even right sometimes. I, I think they're they're right maybe a little bit more often than chance would dictate. But uh, I, I, the analogy back to a, a, the, the weather report, you have a picnic planned for 10 days from now, and the 10-day weather forecast says there's a 60% chance of rain that day. Well, you don't know if it's going to rain or not. You know, they, 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 they may have something going on with that prediction, but maybe it's going to be a clear blue sky. I'd, I'd rate the accuracy of, I'll say, fortune-telling astrologers about parallel to the accuracy of the meteorologist's uh, 10-day forecast. You know, it's worth knowing, but don't take it to the bank. It's, it's like that. Uh, a, a vastly more accurate and vastly more helpful approach is to recognize that it is your fate, and once again, not my favorite word, to face certain questions at certain preordained times, certain questions in a particular order in your life, and put them on the calendar. And all of that can be predicted with tremendous confidence and tremendous accuracy. But what we cannot predict is how you're going to answer those questions. That, that's up to you. So the universe is going to present you with a question. The astrologer can predict the question. I, I would say within the limits of the astrologer's wisdom, the astrologer can uh, suggest that certain answers might be better than others, you know, with those questions and warn you about the slippery slopes of self-delusion and encourage you to the lofty peaks of spiritual evolution. But then you're going to do is it's your business. It's your life. And you're co-creating your life with the planets. The planets, uh, you're not a puppet and the planets have you by the strings. That analogy just doesn't work. This We're living, as you well know, in the quantum age. And, you know, you can predict statistically what a mass of atoms are going to do. But what, what each one is going to do, each electron, you know, you can't predict that. And we we humans seem to be the, the quanta in in on the earth. You know, we we each individually have a high degree of unpredictability. Absolutely. Oh, I'm loving your answers. <laughs> Every single one. Thank you so much. Now, let's talk about ethics. You served on the Ethics Committee of the International Society for Astrological Research, helping to write the Code of Ethics that governs professional astrology. Could you please speak to the issue of ethics, which you have touched upon already in terms of um, forecasting, etc., and responsible forecasting? I've heard you speak in other interviews and presentations about responsible forecasting. So could you please tie this to the issue of, generally speaking, ethics in astrology? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, ethics in astrology, a big subject. Ethics in forecasting, uh, a smaller subject w within that larger framework. I feel that it's absolutely unethical for any astrologer to make any kind of rigid prediction about what will happen. You know, you will get a divorce, you know, or which can do terrible damage to a, a marriage that might make it. Or uh, you will meet somebody, you know, next year, you know, that's, that's sweeter. You know, we might like to hear that if we're a single person, you meet somebody next year. But what if you meet somebody tomorrow who's perfect for you? And you're thinking, oh, that must not be the person because it's not supposed to appear for a year. Even sweet predictions you know, can be damaging. So, you know, this is a, this is a big soapbox for me. I, you know, I preach on this subject quite quite a lot, as you and your audience can probably tell. Um, the broader question of astrological ethics. When I I served on that committee, 
you know, I was thinking a lot of this will, will probably be pretty simple. Right and wrong is often fairly easy to figure out. That was my initial thought. And it turned out to not be true. Like, uh, for example, uh, uh, a classic ethical question is, let's say you have a client and you sense mutual physical attraction to each other. Let's make it simple. You're both single, you know, free, free to do as, as you choose. And and that energy of attraction is there. Uh, is it appropriate to act upon it? You know, is it appropriate to connect romantically with someone who's been a client? Now, everybody agrees uh, there should be a decent interval, you know, you, you know, don't uh, plant a juicy kiss on the person, you know, after they've given you the check, you know, that would that would not be appropriate. So that's clear enough. But but here's here's where <laughs> where we, we we tripped over things. We like uh, for me, my work is it's it feels a lot like the relationship between a psychotherapist and a client in that we, in my work we're dealing with emotionally charged subjects and wounds in the psyche and 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 so there's a tremendously intimate energy of trust that arises between myself and a client typically and and uh for me to approach such a person sexually after a short interval would be an abuse of the trust. You know, we've entered into a situation where they're more vulnerable to me than I am to them. And all the imbalances that, that would arise if we imagine a therapist taking advantage of clients sexually. So how how long an interval, you know, should, should we wait? And of course, that's one of those impossible questions. And that particular ethics committee, uh, my suggestion was three months you know, of of no contact, just because you're writing a law, you have to come up with numbers of some sort. Who who knows what the right answer is, but certainly a, a, a substantial interval of time, you know, for for us to sort of put the astrological session behind us. Where this gets complicated, forgive me, I'm being a little windy about this one, but uh, where where it becomes complicated, uh, another astrologer on that committee uh, did. Uh, financial work, you know, helping a person make stock decisions. And this is often very cut and dried, mechanical, like you're sitting with your financial advisor. It's uh, not intimate in the emotional sense. It's important, you know, money means things to people. But uh, that person was thinking, well, you know, uh, three months is too long because there, there, there aren't the complications that that might exist with a more psychological kind of astrologer. And I, I won't say anything more about it except that we found questions that were slippery like that, just ramified, and and it was all really reflective of, of the fact that the word astrology should probably be pronounced astrologies, plural, because there are just so many different forms of it, so many different approaches, and they each have different ethics. Mm. Yes, very complex area. And there is another aspect to it. You mentioned that often clients or people who seek a reading, astrology reading, are emotionally vulnerable, are wounded, might be going through some really difficult times in their life. So my question mm -hmm. here is, when you have such a client and you see in the chat, there is some really serious challenges coming up. How would you approach such a situation where ethically you want to give the client the information that you can see in the chat and, and what are the trends and what is predicted while being sensitive to their emotional state. In other words, how do you balance giving them the bad news, put simply? Yeah, yes, yeah. It's a it's a delicate and absolutely critical question, of course. Um I, I start off uh, one bow in the general direction of uh the grandfather of us all, Hippocrates, you know, who famously said, first do no harm. Uh, astrology empowers the astrologer with uh almost supernatural insights sometimes and and that can go to the ego pretty easily and and the the urge to be amazing to be dramatic to be impressive 
uh, is something we we really need to keep uh, keep in check. You know, keep it from grabbing the steering wheel. Um, if we're sitting with a client, we learn just by human instincts to to sense uh, you know, through their body language, through their vibrations. You know, if they're getting near a limit, and maybe we see something, we should just not mention it. You know, they their cup is full. We've given them enough to to think about. So throttle back. Uh, that's a, a critical skill. I'm not sure there's any way to teach it. I, I think to a great extent, we're born with that kind of empathy, human empathy and sensitivity. Some of us are, some of us aren't. It's mission critical to not hurting people with with astrology. Uh, so that's, that's critical. I, I'd add um, one more layer to this, though. Um, the what seems like a, a perfectly legitimate question. So if you see something bad coming, how do you present that to the client? Well, I, I'd enter that at a far more basic level. I, I never see something bad coming. Good answer. And, uh, I, I know that sounds a, a bit naive, yeah, but I, I never see anything to be that simple, you know, like this thing that is happening, this Pluto transit to the square to your son, God designed it to hurt you. You know, I mean, I'm not going to give anybody that message because it's just not true. Everything that happens in astrology has uh, uh, it happens for a reason. It's all in divine order. It's it's your fate to face these questions, but it's also your journey to face these questions. And here I'm, I'm repeating myself, but they're questions. You can get them right. And so uh, where another astrologer might look at a certain transit with great fear and trepidation, transiting Pluto, squaring the sun, I say, well, this means you have come to a time in your life when you're ready to deal with a fundamental wound in your psyche that you were not ready to deal with two years ago, just like we protect 10-year-olds from movies we don't protect 15-year-olds from. you know, At some point, we're mature enough to deal with things that we weren't mature enough to deal with earlier. A Pluto transit suggests that you've come to a point where you're ready to heal something. It's going to be hard work. It's going to feel like psychotherapy, whether you have professional help or not. But but it, you can get it right. And here's how to get it right. And I might add, um, and God help you if you don't get it right. Because if you don't get it right, that leaves one possibility. You're going to get it wrong because, well, energy can be neither created nor destroyed, only changed in form, the most basic principle of science. And, and it applies to astrology perfectly. Anything happening in your chart, that energy is there. It's been created. It, the one thing it can't do is go away, but it can be changed in form. And what changes the form of anything in the chart is consciousness, as consciousness interacts with these things. So something bad is coming, or well, maybe something hard, something challenging. I'm not afraid to use language like that. That's accurate language, but there's a way to get it right. And often it's not easy to get it right, but it's not easy to get it wrong either. I mean, it's easy enough to make the mistake, but the, the suffering of getting it wrong is uh, not only typically worse, but it's also meaningless suffering, you know, which is really the worst kind. So I'll, I'll counsel anyone to to respond well and consciously to anything that's coming, no matter how fierce it seems, and and with the absolute knowledge that nothing is designed simply to hurt you astrologically. That that's not how it works. It's all just lessons. Mm, very wise words again. Now, my next uh, point, in fact, links to that. Information based on the charts versus interpretation and counseling. Some people don't want counseling. Yes. They only want the information shown in the charts, factually interpreted by the astrologer. 
I've had astrology readings which were almost like counseling sessions where mm-hmm. the astrology was telling me what I should and shouldn't do, which was their personal advice. I could tell that it was more the personal advice coming from the ego, not a, a reading. Could you just briefly address that point? Should an astrology reading be offered to the client as a counseling session? What is your view on that? Different astrologers uh, have different styles, for sure. Um, I don't think there's any one single way to do it. I, I, I do think that all healthy forms of astrology have the, the impact of counsel on a person. Uh, we're, we're advising people about how to navigate their lives. And, and so that, that, that is counsel by its very nature. But uh, when I, 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 I think of the word counseling uh, out of, outside the context of this conversation, just I, I, I hear somebody referring to counseling, I tend to think of a, of a conversation you know, between the counselor and the person receiving counsel, uh, as if, for example, in, uh, in, in psychotherapy, where the, both the psychotherapist and the client will, will talk and share, uh, typically with the client doing more of the talking than the counselor. Uh, in, in astrological sessions, again, they take many forms, but, but my sessions, uh, if I'm sitting with a person, they, they, I, I still do most of the talking. You know, I, I'm doing a, a presentation. I'm reading the symbols to them, warning them about what a dumb response would look like and encouraging them to the, the higher response. But uh, I, I've done readings where a client says nothing, you know, beyond the hello and, you know, sitting down, but then sits back and takes it in. I, I do a lot of work nowadays recorded where it's a uh, 100% me just doing a presentation, recording it on audio and sending it to China or wherever, Australia even, you know. Uh, and that works. I mean, that's that's a form of counsel, but it's uh, something more like visiting the oracle than, than, than sitting with Sigmund Freud on, on, the, on the analytic couch. Uh, I, what I'm talking about is my style. Uh, uh, there are other styles. It's the art of it, of course, uh, and this is true of any form of counsel, is the fine art of keeping your own ego as far out of it as you can. You know, I I, I can't talk without being Stephen Forrest, without having his values and thinking like he does, uh, it would be naive to imagine that. But I do my best to try to put that aside and and let the chart guide me about the nature of the person so that I'm speaking to, to them. Like uh, some people are naturally uh, solitary, some people naturally career-oriented, some people like to interact emotionally, some people are more guarded about that. And and one thing I teach my students is uh, you can look at the person's chart and know the answer to those kinds of questions. So, you know, before they come in, don't just try to understand their chart, but try to understand what their chart says to you about how they want to be approached, you know, what their values are and, and how how you should present yourself, how you should act in the presence of, of this person. Do you Are you funny and loud or are you sensitive? Offer them a cup of tea and see how they feel. The, the chart will, will tell you, their chart will tell you how, how to build the bridge to them. It's, a, it's an important dimension of astrology that doesn't really get taught enough at the, at the conferences, how to build the bridge. Yes. Oh, beautiful answer again. Thank you. Now, you've touched upon this already earlier, but I would like to perhaps focus on this point. Can astrology read past lives? So, of course, I'm referring here to reincarnation, which I think by now, the majority of people accept reincarnation as a fact of life. So my question is, how do you know that the information you are reading, a particular information you are reading in a chart, is not for this life, but about the person's other lives? How can you discern that? Yes, yes. Uh, 
Let me start with the, the last part of your question, uh, the discernment between whether it's this life or a prior life. Um, I don't think there is such a distinction uh, I, I, because the, the nature of our unresolved karma, leftover stuff from prior lives, as it emerges in astrology, it's, uh, I use a Buddhist term here, it's the karma that has ripened like like the fruit's going to fall from the tree, the it, it will manifest in this lifetime, and and so often I I'm doing the prior life material for a client, and and I've had the experience of the client stopping me and and saying, wait a minute, are you sure you're talking about a past life that happened to me in this life? And I say, mm hmm, that's exactly how it works. That's unresolved karma. We're saying to the universe, set it up again. I want another look at it. And so if uh, if you were tortured by the Spanish Inquisition, you know, to make you a better Catholic, you know, back there in, you know, 1492, uh, and, and then that's unresolved karma, you know, being tortured in the name of Jesus will mess you up. And and so that that's something to to deal with. And, and that's why you have reincarnated in this life into a, a household full of uh, like angry fundamentalists who are saying you're going to go to hell or, and you know these terrible things. It's like an echo of the Inquisition, and and so in the present life we see the fingerprints of the prior life, and that's that's quite fundamental. When I sit with a client and, and I'm doing the the kind of karmic or reincarnational work. There's a, a standard line I almost always use. I say, I'm going to make a very bold claim here. I'm about to tell you a true story about a past life of yours. I say, yeah, that's a bold claim. And then I say, I want to temper that bold claim just a little bit. As I tell you this true story about a past life, I am going to make up all the facts you know, and everybody laughs. It's like I'm joking, but I'm not really joking. I take it a step further. I say, any novel you have ever read or movie you have ever watched that was worth the time it took you to take it in was full of made up facts. It's a work of fiction. But what made it worth watching or reading is it told you the truth about life. That truth is something beyond facts, bigger than facts. So I will give you a parable here. I don't know the literal realities of your prior lives, but I know the essence of them. So here's a story that will ring the emotional bells that need to be rung. I don't vouch for the facts, but I vouch for the essence of it. This is the energy that has reincarnated in you and which is holding you back in this lifetime. You're ready to heal it. You're ready to release it. Here's the problem and here's how to fix it. Wow, beautiful. Okay. I am I'm really ingesting and digesting what what you have just said and what you've been saying throughout this conversation and uh it's like um, amazing pearls of wisdom. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for sharing. I'm, I'm sure that this conversation will be not only interesting to listen to, but will help a lot of people. So thank you. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to reach your audience. But we are not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> Getting there, but not quite. On your website, there is a list of seven core perceptions underpinning evolutionary astrology. One of them says, an acceptance of the fact that all astrological symbols are multidimensional and are modulated into material and psychic expression by the consciousness of the individual. Could you please elaborate on that and explain this principle? Sure, sure. Let me start off by, by saying that uh, astrology is a powerful, eloquent language, but it's, a, it's an unusual one in that there are only a few words in it. Uh, we have 12 signs, 12 houses, uh, uh, half a dozen important aspects, a few more minor ones. Uh, uh, currently, we say 10 planets. The word has become a little bit flexible. But the, the, the point is that that astrology is composed of uh, 
of a few dozen words. That's it. They're, they're, the words are huge in their meaning. And, and that's really where, where it starts to hook into your question, that if we just think of 12 houses and we take the entire universe, all the possibilities that have ever existed or will ever exist, and we put them all in 12 boxes. They're big boxes, you know, they're, 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 they're huge, they're vast. You could talk for the rest of eternity about any astrological symbol and still not cover all the details. Now, life is short, you know, and here we are with our, with our birth charts and, and, and we're all built out of these uh, effectively infinite archetypal fields. And, and then we, from them, we derive this tiny little subset of possibilities that is our actual life, you know, the, the life we have created, the life we choose to live. So which of those possibilities will I, will I bring down into manifestation? That's where my consciousness comes in. So the symbols are, as we said in those words, vast archetypal fields, multidimensional by nature, but life is relatively short and rather three-dimensional and full of hard choices, not this, not this, not this, but just this. And, and so out of this vast field, we make certain choices. My, my favorite illustration here in, in, in terms of just making this come alive for people, it always puts a smile on people's faces. I'm thinking of the, the seventh house which is classically the house of, of marriage. It, it has some other meanings too, of course, but but there. And I, I I ask somebody if they're, you know, midlife, you know, think of people you might have married, you know, if circumstances were different. You know, I, I, as soon as I, I say that, everybody smiles. There, There's these roads not taken, you know, where, where the time just wasn't right or the circumstances weren't right. And maybe we're happily in a partnership and not longing to be with this other person. But, you know, hmm, that could have happened. I wonder, I wonder what that life would have been. But uh, when it comes to, to marriage, uh, it's, it's a great help to choose one person, you know. And, and so life is brutal that way, you know, where, where we have to make these hard choices, not just choosing between good and evil or anything as grossly obvious as that, but, but choosing among the various goods, the various possibilities, all the different work we could have done, all the different places we could have lived. But over and over again, it comes down to, so what are you going to do? What are you actually going to do with this one body and this one lifetime? So out of this virtually infinite field of possibilities, we reduce it to almost nothing, the infinitesimal reality of one human life. That's what that line is about. And this obviously could be a, a whole separate conversation on a whole separate podcast because this yeah. just opens so many doors and rabbit holes we could go into. Thank you. Now, Stephen, before we talk about your work, I've got one more question, which is a foreshadowed <laughs> mind-twisting question, for which uh, I, I need to give a bit of a preamble. There was a new series on Gaia TV about the Awakening Conference, which was held in Blackpool, UK, last year. There's a series of episodes, series of presentations by various speakers. The most recent episode is a presentation by Andrew Gough, titled Inner Earth, Hollow or Concave, in which he proposes, based on the various spiritual and esoteric texts, books, archaeological findings and mythology, that not only there is a number of inner earths inside our planet, each with its own inhabitants and life-supporting environment, but also that we live in an inner earth enclosed by the firmament our sky, with the sun, the moon, the stars, which we cannot penetrate. So effectively, he proposes that we live in a snowball, 
if you are familiar with this lovely mantelpiece object. Now, I've read and heard about the inner earth concept or mythology within our planet, but this proposition is probably the most outlandish one anyone has ever conceived in modern times and is not only incredibly fascinating per se, but if true, it would turn our understanding of the world completely upside down with the science and everything in it. And uh, just as a small digression, what is also intriguing, what I find intriguing, is that as I was listening to him, to his presentation, I remembered that as a little child, so three, four years old, that's exactly how, what I believed the world was, that the sky was like a ceiling or a dome enclosing the earth. And I recommend watching this presentation, by the way, it is on Gaia. It's, it's fascinating in its own right. But out of all the consequences of this proposition, my question to you is a two-pronged flip side, if you like. <laughs> Firstly, could this be possible from the astrology point of view? And secondly, on the flip side, if, and I'm going out on the limb here all the way, if this was true, what would be the implications for astrology, which maps our energetic blueprints in the sky as a body of knowledge and practice? I, I guess the first thing I, I, I should say is that much of this is miles outside my own area of knowledge or expertise. When I'm speaking about astrology, I, I speak with some confidence and authority based on my experience. But but here I'm not sure what to say. The 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 piece of what you said that 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 I really liked and felt very comfortable with was that that sense of being enclosed by the firmament, enclosed by the sky. You know, of course, scientifically, we realize we're not enclosed by the sky. But there, you know, we're in the universe and and so on. And one could go out at least 50 million light years in every direction if we had patience and time. Um, but it stands as a powerful metaphor, you know, the sense that that we humans are enclosed and blinded by three-dimensional space, that we we believe uh, collectively there is a belief that what we see is reality and what we don't see isn't real. And and yet here we are, even the physicists are, of course, famously saying what the mystic is, what mystics have been saying all along. And and that's that the, the basic equations of, and formulas of the universe. Uh, last I heard super string theory, they solve best in 11 dimensions, not three dimensions. I'm personally expecting a, they'll find a 12th, but I'm a little bit biased. But I, I don't think they even know what that means. But, but what, what's solidly pretty much proven now is that the three-dimensional universe is, uh, is a subset of the actual universe. And yet we humans are enclosed in it, not able to see beyond it, you know, kind of sealed in by the sky in that sense. We're sealed in by, by three dimensions. That I, I find evocative and helpful. I, I may be proven wrong here, but I, I, I'd be wide open to that and kind of even delighted. But uh, I, I am inclined to take seriously the fact that uh, as you dig down into the earth, it gets cooler and then it starts getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And it, it's almost like our ancestors talking about the fires of hell under earth. I, I don't I don't believe that, but but there were I, I, I think they were on to something intuitively that there's this core of magma and uh it's hard to believe that there would be beings, uh beings with physical bodies living there. I, again, I may be wrong. But I, I, I'm inclined to reject that idea that there are beings living there, you know, letting the word be uh, a, a little more spacious than the idea of physical bodies. Sure, I believe the universe is pervaded with with beings that that don't have bodies the, the way we have. In fact, uh, I think every one of us on the earth has spent uh, a lot of time, maybe even more, more time, uh, not in a body, 
than anybody. You know, it's like we've all been there and we'll all be there again. Mm. Yes, thank you. This is a, uh, a fascinating or as much fascinating as complex and intriguing topic. And at the end of the day, we don't know until we find evidence of that. But yes, I just found this. I've actually watched it three times because I've, I've, I found it so intriguing, the whole concept of not just the inner earth, but that we are the inner earth. It's just, um, yeah, it's it's very evocative, as you said, and and thought-provoking. Okay, Stephen, let's now talk about your work. I understand that the wait for the in-person readings with you has now grown to about eight years. And for the recordings, it's even longer, which is amazing. So I understand that you don't take any new orders uh, and new clients, but you have trained many astrologers in your brand of astrological practice. My question is, can we expect from them the same level of expertise and skill? And obviously, people are drawn to you for a reason, for a good reason, because you have an enormous and, and exceptional wisdom. So is it true that there is an eight years waiting list? <laughs> yes. People wow. would contact me for readings and I would add them to the list. And and uh, I, I sort of dimly realized the, the list seemed to be getting longer and longer. And and it was two, two and a half years ago, I, I finally bravely sat down and started looking at how long the lists had gotten. And I was thinking it, they were three or four years ahead, but they actually turned out to be, as you say, about eight years for the live stuff and 10 years for the rest. And it was a terrible mistake because I, you know, I was in, in my early seventies at that point, and and uh, I was realized I was making promises that I might not be able to keep, and just because of longevity issues, and and so I, I I just closed the lists at that point, and I'm I'm hoping to keep the promises that I that I have made. I'm not doing nearly as many uh, personal readings as I used to. I used to do about nine every week. Uh, and now I'm doing about four, and that's uh, mostly because I've needed to make time for other projects, namely the the school that I've created, the Forest Center for Evolutionary Astrology. I used to run apprenticeship programs. Uh, I had one in Australia, in fact, for about 10 years, and one in uh, Europe for a similar length of time, uh, a few here in, a, in, the, in the U.S., and uh, they they turned out about two thousand people who you know were trained in my methods and many to establish practices. They're all in a directory on my website. But uh, I, I've decided to or did decide to create an online school, and uh, it's it's more rigorous than my apprenticeship program. There are tests and grades and 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 so on. We try to support everybody and passing, but it, it takes hard work. And uh, that that opened in 2020. And it's, it's going, it's going quite well, we've got a couple hundred students, and uh, it's, uh, it's meaningful and fun. And I'm just at a stage of life where, where it feels most appropriate to be passing on the torch, you know, rather than seeing if I can live long enough to, <laughs> to fill those, those two long waiting lists. To, to have another 1000 clients. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sort of the, the race to the finish line. You know? <laughs> I'm enjoying being old, but I'm also I, I didn't fail biology, so you know, <laughs> I don't want to be friends for thirty years from now. <laughs> well, Stephen, for all I know, you you could live well over one hundred. They say that that uh, humans are really designed to live till about one hundred and twenty, and it oh. is just yeah. So like biologically and in terms of our DNA, we are coded to live until about 120 on average. So there are obviously other factors come into play here. Yes. Yeah, so in fact, my, my next question was about your center, your online school. So given that it is online, anyone in the world can join, can sign up and they can do the courses. Is it self-paced or is it in a fixed time frame? Uh, it's actually both. Uh, we have we have self-paced 
programs, but the the main thrust of the school is uh, is is set up on a kind of semester basis with with things happening on on schedule. So there's uh, there there are live classes. I mean via Zoom uh, and discussion groups and so on and. Uh, students interacting with each other, so we have to all sort of stay on the same page. But we we do provide uh, an alternative path for people who who can't go at that pace. Mm-hmm. Lovely. So and obviously all the information is on your website, and I will include in the show notes the links to both your homepage and the website for the school and books, so that people can access those resources and and uh, take advantage of them. Now, my final question, before I ask for your final thought, (laughs) is do you work with scientists or have you worked with scientists studying the nature of reality and consciousness, such as the Institute of Noetic Sciences? So I'm talking about Dr. Helene Wabe, Dr. Dean Radin and others. Has astrology been ever studied from the scientific perspective? Oh, let's see. Uh, again, this is not really my area of expertise. There, there are um, there are a, a lot of astrologers, a significant movement among astrologers that are concerned with uh, uh, essentially establishing uh, statistical databases that support and, in a sense, prove astrology that that we are able to reach out speaking the language of science to scientists and some serious progress is being made with that uh, fellow in the U.S. state of Florida named David Cochran, who was the president of uh, the International Society for Astrological Research for a while, has done quite a lot of work in in that regard. It's an area which I, I find interesting, but I'm not engaged with it personally. Uh, you know, my my work is essentially about taking the basic principles of astrology and turning them into a, a choice centered system of counseling. You know that that makes a difference in people's lives one at a time, and we've we've gotten plenty of evidence that that works. But obviously, it's not exactly hard science. So uh, it's again, it's just kind of not really my area. I've not worked personally with any scientists. Uh, uh, I mean, scientists have come to me for readings sometimes, and bless their hearts for being an open mind. <laughs> they walk away thinking there's something to this. But uh, I haven't worked formally uh, in in a scientific framework. I have spoken at at, at the Institute for Noetic Science. Uh, you know, I, I've done some okay. some work there, and and I, I was happy to do that. Proud to do that. If you'll spare me one more anecdote, I I, I was invited uh, to the University of Arizona here in America. There's a, a fellow who's a bit of a luminary in the integrative medicine world. He, he may be known in Australia, uh, Dr. Andrew Weil, who opened the, the one of the first integrative medicine programs. I was invited to address the fellows in his program. Now, these are these are already medical doctors. And uh, three or four hundred of them apply each year to this program. They accept fifteen. So I mean, this is really the cream of the crop. And here, here's the story: I, I was able to do a two-day program uh, with these people, giving each of them—they're all friends—and giving them uh, essentially little mini readings. I'd look at their chart and and say what I saw, so they could actually see the stuff working. And went around the room, you know, to, in depth with each person. And it was, oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, uh, this is incredible. I came to one woman and she's, no, it's not me. She was, you could see she was embarrassed. She wanted to me to be right, but she couldn't admit it. And because I, you know, I, I was saying all these terrible or incorrect things to her. Oh, it's so embarrassing, but what can I do? I'm sorry. On to the next person. And it's like 15 people and, and, uh, you know, but it was working except for this one woman. And then it was a two day program. The next morning, she came in and she was embarrassed. She said, I talked to my mother last night and I had given you the wrong birth time. 
see, from a scientific point of view, this was Santa Claus coming because I was able to prove that I could produce results. Give me garbage data and I'll give you garbage <laughs> back again. It, it was the greatest blessing in the world from a scientific point of view. <laughs> oh, it's a great, great story. And and uh, in a sense, it encapsulates the essence of astrology. And as you said, garbage in, garbage out, incorrect data, incorrect outcomes or yes. information. So beautiful. Well, Stephen, this has been an incredible conversation, as I said, peppered, uh, or in fact, not, I take it back, not peppered, but a continuous string of beautiful pearls of wisdom. That's the only way I can describe it. And I am absolutely grateful for it. Would you like to to give us some final thought or a message that you would like to leave our audience with? Thank yes, you. anything that you'd like to say to, to close our conversation? Yes, yes, definitely. We live in a, probably the, the least spiritually oriented, most materialistic time in human history. And the materialist, existentialist uh, model of life that we tend to encounter as the basic assumption about life, even watching situation comedies or cop shows on television, just modern common sense in quotes as it's presented is the triumph of the idea of a random pointless universe in which awful things happen to good people and, you know, and, and so on. And there it is and nothing matters. And death is the worst case scenario, but you can't avoid it. You know, that's the basic model. And the message of astrology is that that is an incorrect model and that life, in fact, is, is simply not random and purposeful. And, and we can prove that once we see astrology working, we see the orderliness behind what seems to be the chaos of, of daily life and inevitably the feeling that something is drawing us all into a higher state of consciousness. And this, this model of life, which uh, again, astrology, I think can convince us is the accurate model, re-enchants the universe and, and rescues us from this existentialist, materialist, triumph that we're we're seeing everywhere and uh, as traditional religions seem to be losing their hold on people's consciousness and losing their ability to speak to people this idea that we're enchanted beings and an enchanted purposeful universe is i, I think the the time has come for astrology to dare i say save the world at least contribute to that beautiful oh so so beautifully said well, Stephen, thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure and honor to have you on my show. And thank you so much for being on Quantum Living. Well, thank you so much, Anna. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, that was fun. <laughs> That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then... Keep your vibrations high and be well.